Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Skillshare webinar for data classification towards GDPR compliance. My name is Martin Cox. I'm legal administrator for BCS. Um, I've been uh, working as an advisor for our internal GDPR project. Um, the quote you see on the screen uh, was technically said by me. Um, and it is a very key part of what we're trying to do and explain today. Um, our speaker today is David King from CECOM. He is an expert in data classification and he will be taking us through some of the concepts today. There will be a question and answer session at the very end. Uh, so please run, uh, well, ask as many questions using the tool uh, in the application as possible throughout and we'll see as many, how many questions we can get answered at the end. I'll just pass you over to David now so he can introduce himself properly. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Martin. So, first of all, I maybe should start by saying that I'm I'm not actually a lawyer. Um, I probably wish I was right now. Um, they must be rubbing their hands with uh, the forthcoming, forthcoming legislation. Um, but I'm not. As Martin said, I'm more of a data classification champion. So, today I'm going to start by introducing data classification. It's a fairly simple concept, yet I believe that very few companies do it, or if they do, very few do it well. So I'm going to look at why do data classification, because um, I think that's important. What are some of the drivers for doing it and, and how it can help? Then I'm going to consider different types of classification schemes and talk through what the UK government currently do. Um, they went through a process way back uh, in 2014 of simplifying their data classification scheme from, I think it was six or seven different labels down to three. I'm going to do all that before I introduce GDPR into the conversation, as I think the benefits will hopefully become a bit more obvious. Um, and then I'm only going to focus really on some specific parts of GDPR. Finally, I'm going to leave you with some practical steps that you can take away to, to help achieve GDPR compliance. It won't make you compliant. I'm not sure what will. Um, typically, the programs you need to do for that are much, much larger. But it'll certainly move you in the right direction. Um, it's quite relevant, actually, having just had the London Marathon. I think a GDPR compliance program is a bit like that. You know, But you've got to start. Uh, hopefully, you know where the finish line is. And pretty much, you can choose your own route to get there. So hopefully, what I'll suggest today will give you some ideas about uh, that uh, training steps you can do for your marathon. So Martin obviously gave you a very, very brief bit about myself. Um, I'll give you a little bit more. First of all, I'm one of a number of growing uh, GDPR practitioner qualified people, uh, recognizing how significant the legislation was, or the, reg the regulation was going to be. Uh, we'll talk about regulation and legislation shortly. I actually sat my exams way back in 2016 because uh, I recognised what it was going to do. I also said I'm a data classification champion. Uh, I'm a member of Dharma International. They're all about uh, data management. Uh, and I really got into that whilst doing my master's degree in cybersecurity, which I completed in 2016. A lot of the students there were focused on the very technical side of cybersecurity. But coming from a working background, um, I was much more interested in how you manage risk, governance and the compliance side of things. Um, at the time, I was working for a large media and advertising company, and we had about 70 terabytes of data. Um, and it was mostly unstructured. Now, if they'd have started a data classification program, I think they would have had significant challenges. And that's why I decided to write my final paper on data classification. I paired it with digital forensics because I thought there were some problems with classification. Um, and I also looked at a lot of the different products uh, and technologies out there for doing data classification. So if you have specific questions about uh, any of the products on the market today, I'm probably quite well placed to talk about them. I should also add, I'm no spring chicken. I've been working for 35 years. Uh, the last five years or so, I've been in security. Uh, prior to that, I've done just about every conceivable IT job you can think of. Most recently, I was director of security and governance for um, that large media and advertising firm. But working backwards, I've done computer audits, including those related to acquisition. I've managed data centers, um, Sarbanes-Oxley, when that was around 2002, 2003. I wrote uh, 
much of the program for that. I've managed support desks for other media companies. I've done computer operations support and the, and the whole remit. I've also worked in a variety of industries. So whilst the last 17 years or so I've been in media and advertising, I've uh, had spares, spells in consulting, airport and air, airline transport, commercial property and manufacturing. And it's only a, been a year that I've turned to the dark side and now work for a cybersecurity reseller and managed security service provider. And it's quite interesting, really. Uh, I work for a reseller and we don't sell any data classification software. However, I do often talk about classification uh, because it's quite dear to me. So what is it? Here's one definition. Now, admittedly, you'll notice this from a, a company there, Digital Guardian, who do provide data classification software. But I think it's fairly accurate, fairly generic, um, and covers all the main uh, points that I want to see. Now, they've put the emphasis on protected more efficiently. However, I think the key word here is process. In my world, data classification is more about the process that needs to be followed, where data gets tagged and identified. Um, and that makes it much easier to track uh, and, and use. It should also make it easier to find. And once you get data that's easy to identify, easy to track, and easy to find, uh, is that you know the only reason for doing data classification? Well, from my point of view, no. There's lots of other reasons. Uh, I've only listed five here, and obviously the last one is going to link back into our regulation. Um, but if you start with identification, I think people often need to be told, reminded about what data is important. We deal with so much data nowadays that we often get lost in uh, in emails and volume and paperwork, and we're not always sure what's important and what's not. We just kind of handle it as, as a matter of fact, whereas some of it should be handled more sensitively than others. So by visibly marking information, everybody should know how important or, or otherwise it is. Maybe it's not important. It can be shared all over the place. Um, and whether it can be copied or shared, um, or whether it needs to be reported, deleted, or, or stashed away. Now that, that links to quite naturally with awareness. However, when you start talking about awareness and, and marking, there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that overall security awareness within a business uh, improves, um, especially when you start using visible document marking. People talk about documents more, they're therefore uh, more careful the way they handle stuff. You know, you, you don't find quite so many printed documents left sitting on the printer or lying around on desktop. Uh, and that improved document handling improves user awareness and makes them more security conscious overall. Also, if you're able to identify what's important, means you can probably identify what's not important. Now, there's been lots of statistics and studies done about data on networks, especially unstructured data. And there are figures as high as 70% um, that say 70% of the network data that you have is what they term as rotten. And that stands for redundant, obsolete, or trivial. Now, by removing that data, you can potentially have significant financial savings. I mean, if you're storing more data than you need, it certainly adds cost. You're probably also backing it up, which extends the backup window unnecessarily, and you're storing it somewhere off-site on tapes that you probably don't need. Now that's all additional cost. So by removing that rotten data, you can also see operational improvements, you know, better indexing, quicker access, quicker recovery time, quicker recovery times. Um, again, in my previous example, I said we had over 70 terabytes of data, probably of which only 20 was important. And out of that 20, probably a third or a quarter would have been highly confidential and needed to be treated in a special way. So finally, I've listed legal or compliance as a, as a reason. Now, some organizations have to label documents and have to classify them. And they're the ones that typically have quite mature programs already. So we'll be talking about GDPR shortly. Um, but subject access requests, appropriate technical controls, and breach notification all benefit from classification schemes. So hopefully you'll see that you know doing data classification is a good idea, uh, and you decide that you know maybe you should think about implementing it. But where do you go next? What schemes do you use, and how do you start?
Well, many of us in, in our homes probably all already use some form of classification. You know, if you consider your home, there's a probably a strong possibility that you're using iTunes or Spotify, and you have your libraries indexed or sorted or classified by some sort of uh, key, whether that be by genre, preferred music type, by artist, or similar. Um, you might also be into films. Now, films are often classified as well, typically by age, um, you know, whether it's uh, explicit consent or you know suitable for children. That's a classification scheme in itself. But on the left of this slide, I've, t I've uh, listed some of the more common data classification schemes uh, that you typically see. And you need to choose what's most appropriate to you. Now, on the right, I said earlier that uh, the UK government simplified their classification down to just three uh, from six or seven. Um, and the other thing we should say is, is that for our use now, you know, when we're talking about data classification, it's not just about pulling out personally identifiable information or PI or PII. You know, it can be any kind of information that's sensitive to your company. It might be mergers, acquisitions, or it could be intellectual property, it could be plans, designs, recipes. I mean, if you think KFC or Coca-Cola, the uh, security they have around the recipes for their their sauce or their their coating or their their uh, actual Coca-Cola itself, you know, they're they're quite keen to protect those recipes. So as I said, the the right hand side is is focused on the UK government. Uh, they have a, a big policy document that accompanies their uh, classification scheme, which describes basically how to classify your information assets um, and ensure that they're appropriately protected. And also then how that supports other businesses. And that applies to all information that the government collects, um, all stores, processes, or shares with external people. They typically pass down documents to third parties and they're very keen to ensure that the same classification schemes are used by their suppliers and providers as they use internally because obviously the confidentiality confidentiality of their their information is quite important so before we talk about this one perhaps it would be a good time to do a quick poll hopefully on the right hand side somewhere you'll see a poll pop up with a, a specific question um, we want to know, is your organization already taking steps to become GDPR compliant? Obviously, now we're exactly one month away from the regulation becoming law. Um, and it's probably at this point in time we should say that, you know, GDPR is a regulation and it's not a directive. So where we had the Data Protection Act, uh, 1998, that was born out of a an EC Regulation 95. And basically that was the UK's interpretation of that directive. However, GDPR is, is a regulation itself. It unifies the rules across all member states. Um, if you look into the actual regulation, it consists of 11 chapters, 99 articles, of which I'm going to highlight a few, and 173 recitals. And the recitals are there really to, a bit like a, a dictionary or a thesaurus, give you meaning for some of the terms they use. And in some ways, the GDPR is actually easier to use than the, the DPA was. Um, I mean, it only has six principles where the DPA had eight. Uh, and at the heart of it is this article, Article 5. So it looks like from the poll, lots of people are doing something. It's, um, There are a few people that seem not to know what GDPR is, which is uh, a bit worrying with a, with a month ago, but that's that's fine. Um, and it seems like also quite a lot of people are either mid-program or doing at least something, which is good. Uh, there's been a lot of polls around across different industries which say that there's still two thirds of small businesses don't know about it or aren't doing anything about it. So that's uh, at least many of us here are doing something about it, which is good. Now, as I said, you know, we are looking here at Article 5, and this is kind of like the heart of the, the new General Data Protection Regulation. It talks about data processing being lawful, fair, transparent. You know, the data that you collect should only be used for the reason you collect it. 
you should only keep what you need for as long as you need it. You need to make sure it's accurate and obviously you need to look after it in a safe and secure manner. By going through my data classification program and deleting data that you don't need, what I referred to earlier as rotten data, you're minimizing the data you hold and therefore your exposure. It also means you're probably only storing that data for as long as it's required, which kind of fits into the storage limitation. Now, there's lots of other things within the GDPR, uh, and one phrase that pops up a couple of times is state of the art, as does the phrase appropriate organizational and technical measures, which I mentioned earlier. That phrase appears 18 times, and the word technical appears around 40 times. So by not having appropriate controls, you're likely to suffer a much higher fine should you have a data breach. Uh, and I think the fines themselves are pretty well publicized uh, and are fairly significant. So you want to comply with Article 5. If you think compliance is a good idea, where do you start? And this is kind of like the real nitty gritty. So I've broken this down into four fairly simple steps. And these are supposedly represented by my graphics, so I apologize for them. Um, but it comes into discovery, qualify, classify, and review. Now this sounds easy, and it is if you plan it properly. Now some of them are gonna need technical tools to be able to do properly and efficiently, and I'll talk about some of those. Um, but first of all, you need to do your discovery piece. It's always the first step. I mean, you can't apply any of the, the GDPR recommendations. Uh, they talk about encryption, pseudonymization, uh, and, the, and the like, until you know where your data is. I mean, if you don't know what you have, then there's not that much that can be done about it. Now, my graphic top left is supposed to show how networks used to be fairly self-contained. You know, you used to have a server in the office, your data was on that. Nowadays, our data lives everywhere you know we use public cloud we use private cloud we use a mixture of the two we've got hybrid solutions um, we've got multi-cloud solutions we use software as a service we use file sharing sites we use social media um, and it makes it all relatively easy to share data with people both inside our organizations and outside uh, and makes it very easy to to store data uh, wherever we want it to um, and some of the drivers for that is, you know, we want to use any device anywhere, anytime. Uh, we want to work from home. We want to work in the local cafe. We want to reply to people's emails, you know. So we've got this data everywhere nowadays. Uh, so that becomes very difficult. In February 2015, going back a couple of years, there was a, a survey done. Uh, and it basically said that the average public sector organization used to use around about 700 cloud-based services. Now, I ran a similar exercise in my own network when I was working for media and advertising uh, from our European data center. And, and out, of this, out of the 16 or so thousand cloud-based services that were known about, we were using 2,400 or so. Um, and that means our data could have been anywhere. Now, another one of the articles within the GDPR is Article 35, and that brings in the concept of privacy by design and by default, um, and also data protection impact assessments. And again, to do that, you need to know where your data is. So that's why I said, you know, you've got to have some sort of technical ability here to be able to track and trace your data. But once you've done that, and you know where your data is, do you know what it is? Um, it's one thing to know volume, document types, um, you know, where you've got spreadsheets, where you've got Word documents, who's got music files, and all that kind of stuff. But do you know what that data actually contains, you know, and more importantly, who's using it? Um, are the right people you, uh, accessing it? And the other thing when, when you do your discovery piece is, is trying to work out who's responsible for that data, because that's really important, uh, using and involving the data owner or person responsible for that data is also key to a classification scheme because they're going to be the ones that are probably going to be able to give it the most accurate qualification. So you know where it is, you know what it is. The next point is obviously to de decide whether you still need it. I talked earlier about redundant, obsolete and trivial. 
delete what you don't need. You'll have less to classify when you do start. Again, go back to my example, 70 terabytes of unstructured data. Why classify all of that if you only need to classify 20? You're going to save yourself a lot of work. Um, but don't just classify documents, classify services. We've already said, you know, the average public sector organization used to use over 700 cloud-based services. Do they need to? Classify those, you know, to stop them maybe putting documents up there that, uh, that shouldn't be going up there. Because um, typically people should only have access to services and author uh, uh, services that they need, uh, and they should be authorized in the same way that they, uh, you do documents. Now, the easiest way to classify documents is to label them. Now, sometimes that's referred to as protective marking. It's easy to put headers and footers on documents or watermarks nowadays with, with the tools that we have. So use some form of visible marking. If you struggle, you could always start by putting uh, protective markings or document marking on new documents and then go back to the older ones as and when. Um, because often it's it's quite challenging to go back and, and start classifying existing documents. But the thing to do is start. If you if you don't start, you'll never finish. You know, if you don't start your marathon, you'll never get to the finish line. Over time, more and do more documents will be marked, and uh, as documents are aged and retired or deleted, it'll make uh, your overall percentage better. As I said, this also raises awareness internally. And as people get used to handling documents, they'll start uh, labeling them themselves. This obviously needs to be accompanied by a, a proper training scheme uh, and your company should do this so that everybody knows how to mark or label a document and what the criteria is you know once you've decided on your, your data classification policy you've decided on your on your labels whether it be critical successful or otherwise um, you know people need to understand what makes a document confidential what makes it public what makes it internal only also by having documents or data marked it allows better perimeter controls to be implemented. As I mentioned earlier, GDPR talks about appropriate technical measures to be used to reduce the likelihood of a breach. Uh, perimeter controls that can identify data marking, such as keywords or metadata, would be an appropriate countermeasure. So my little man there sat on his pile of books is review and report. Now, GDPR isn't a checkbox. It's not a do once exercise, unlike a car MOT. It's kind of more like having an MOT every day. It needs to pass all the time. You know, Ultimately, we're just following the Deming cycle of plan, do, check, act, or that continual improvement cycle. Um, and again, you also need to consider data protection impact assessments for all data at all times. Now, Microsoft has a good, mic uh, yeah, actually Microsoft have a good GDPR microsite they use discover, manage, protect, and report in their in their cycle. Um, discover everything. Everything starts with discovery. Manage, govern how you use it and access it. Protect through security controls. That's the appropriate technical measures, and then that reporting, making sure your controls are sufficient uh, for the the risk that's involved. Now this this slide here, I'm sure most of you have probably seen this one already. It's from the Information Commissioner's Office. It's got a fair bit of guidance. Um, and whilst classification and data classification isn't pulled out as a single item, I think it could be um, attributed to several of the areas here. We're talking about an awareness, the information you hold, access rights, access requests, breaches, and again, protection by uh, design. I believe all these areas would be better or easier to implement by employing a data classification program. Um, and basically, I've come up with my own recommendations, uh, which is start by doing a data audit. Again, that's that discovery piece. It's also useful to do uh, they call data mapping exercises or data flows. Uh, all of them are really useful. Get rid of the stuff you don't need. As I said, if you've got less to protect, it's going to be much cheaper. Uh, if you're only protecting a small subset, you can put much tighter controls around it. Classify what's left. Uh, and then we put one other one on there is what you could do personally. Now, that relates to two points, really. First, I think about what you do, the data you hold, and what you can do for your company, You know how you can bring awareness, how you can start. You can. There's nothing to stop you labeling documents already 
Um, do you know if your company has a data classification policy? Do you follow it? Um, but secondly, you know, we're all we're all users, we're all subjects. We've got new rights. Um, chapter three in the GDPR is all about our rights, subject access requests, data portability, the rights to be forgotten, etc. Um, so you know, you might want to think about the information that other companies are holding about you. Obviously, quite interesting with the Facebook scenario right now, and I'm sure people have got lots to say about you know about that. <clears throat> and had GDPR been in already. And maybe the timing of the the uh, the leak was deliberate. Maybe, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> I mean, a fine of four percent of your global annual turnover is going to be fairly significant. <clears throat> excuse me, for an organisation like that. Um, so they would have had a real problem. <clears throat> excuse me. So that's pretty much all I've got uh, to say. Uh, I'm going to hand back over to. Martin to see whether there's any questions come in uh, and uh, yeah happy to take questions thank you um, that was brilliant David thank you for that so we've had one question come in so far which is uh, where should the responsibility lie for GDPR in an organization for example IT reporting into the board directly um, this one is it, it is a board level uh, conversation that needs to be had it is Ultimately, it should be the, the CEO or the managing director who ensures that the right things are being done. But it's about forming a team or a project group of the correct individuals. You will need representation from IT, but this isn't an IT project. You will want representation from your compliance and legal teams, but it's not a compliance and legal project for them to lead on their own. It's a collaborative thing because as David mentioned, data, there is personal data, there is normal data there are across the an entire organization. Without the data, we aren't an organization. So the responsibility goes right to the very top. And I'm hoping that answers the question. Um, have you got any thoughts on that, David? Um, yeah, also for certain organizations, uh, depending on the type of data they, they, they own, hold or process, Obviously, certain organizations need to appoint a, a data protection officer. That's also ingrained within the GDPR. Um, I think there are three three criteria, and that's um, if you're a public sector organization, you need to have a DPO. If you handle data that relates to um, special category data, that's uh, sexual, criminal, medical, um, and that kind of data. Again, that's all outlined. Uh, I think it's Article 9 within the GDPR. Uh, so if you handle all that kind of data, you need to appoint a DPO. And also, if you do um, a lot of automated processing of large numbers of records. Now, <clears throat> there's no definitive on what a large number of records is. Um, but if you've got one of the, if you um, satisfy one of those three criteria, you need to have a DPO. And again, the DPO's rights, uh, roles and responsibilities are quite clearly outlined within the GDPR. They are supposed to report in directly to the board, um, ideally the CEO. They should be independent, so not responsible to finance or um, IT. Uh, and they should also be the first point of contact for the, the Inflation Commissioner's Office or the supervisory authority within the country. And the other thing we should just point out here is um, with the impending, with us in, uh, planning to leave the EU next year, it's still relevant. Um, the UK data protection bill is currently passing through the house as well. Um, so that's likely to be even tougher, um, but carries many of the same themes through it. So, you know, don't, don't think that you can kind of twiddle your thumbs and wait a year and hope not to get breached because we're leaving the EU. That's also, also not the case. Um, the UK data protection bill coming in uh, as we leave will basically replace the EU GDPR. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we've got another question here. To achieve GDPR for an organization, does the IT team have to work with the legal team? Uh, yes, is the simple answer. The long answer is legal. Everyone uh, needs to be involved. Um, you'll find in your organization that not well, IT may well manage the systems, and we found it here at BCS as well, is different business units manage certain systems in a certain way. So they are the internal data controllers, so to speak. 
so they are so they need to be involved as well um it is a, a full organization level uh project and with four weeks left to go um it's a significant task to undertake and um yeah so it so yes simple answer yes they do and should be working with everyone to make sure this is done um we've got another question here uh, are there any formal document templates for performing data classification or is it down to each individual business need and this one i'm assuming is for david <laughs> yeah for, um, actually it goes to the um the next question as well um which is what would you expect to see in a data classification policy so there are no formal documented templates. Um, it's typically up to every individual organization uh, to decide what's important to them. Uh, but typically what you'd see in a, in a, in a classification policy is a, is a statement um, about why. You would also see somewhere uh, in that policy the, um, the actual classifications and what they relate to. Um, and you'd also probably have some sort of reference to what impact for not doing data classification and not following the policy would be. So some sort of, a, you know, by not, do, no, by not uh, classifying a document properly, what the impact of that would be uh, to the, either the individual or the business. Um, but to get to get a, a decent template, I mean, there are there are a few out there. I mean, if you go on to, I'm sure the British Computer Society have have one or two in their in their uh, document libraries. Um, but there's lots. Of, if you go to IT Governance website, I'm sure they have one. Um, or if you just do a Google uh, for an IT data classification policy, um, you're going to get one. Equally, I've written several. So if you want to contact me, uh, I'm quite happy to. Uh, remove anything that's specific to my company and forward them on to, to you. Uh, I'm quite happy to do that because ultimately you've got to have a starting point. And again, you know, policies aren't a, um, a right once forget about documents. You know, policies should be a living document. They, they do need to adapt and change as uh, the situation changes. So, you know, you might want to start off with a policy and we've seen that the UK government changed their policy classification schemes from six down to three, uh, probably because they recognise that what they had was too hard to deal with. Uh, they wanted to make life simpler because what's confidential to one person might not be confidential to another. So it's all about outlining what uh, what those categories mean. Excellent. Um, so we've got a, a long question here. So if someone asks for their personal data to be deleted, where does that end? Presumably the controller owns transa transaction information, even if the master customer record is removed. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, David? Yeah, um, obviously that's that's going to be quite quite a lot of us are going to be doing this uh, in the not too distant future, asking for our personal records to be deleted. Um, now there are some exceptions. I think I, I may have uh, mentioned that uh, towards the end. There are exceptions, um, and you can find these on the ICO's website uh, for when transactions don't have to be deleted. Um, Companies have to, so if I was to write to my previous employers and say, hey, look, forget me, um, they would still have to keep a record of my start and end dates, uh, which obviously means they have to keep some information about me, but they don't need to, you know, they don't need to know that I cut myself or I fell over or I, you know, I caused an accident, whatever. Um, you know, they only need to keep what's required for other legislation uh, and regulation. Um, Presumably the controller owns transaction information even when the master customer record is removed. Yeah, and again, they'll, they'll need to maintain some of that. I mean, if, they've, if there's other uh, regulatory pressure, obviously if you're doing financial transactions uh, and you've been shopping on a website and you say, I want you to forget me, obviously they're, no, they're gonna need to keep a record of that financial transaction uh, for a period of time as well. And that may, um, but again, they shouldn't be using that data for any other reason than maintaining a record of it so they can't be sharing it with anybody else without your explicit consent uh, so it does become quite quite tied down yeah i mean right to forget it can only go so far as you said and a lot of it will be instructions to stop processing as in that example about using a website 
Um, I just want to make sure that it's understood that if you're receiving a service from an organization, so you couldn't tell your existing gas supplier to forget you because you will not no longer get gas. And it, is, it sounds like a silly thing to mention, but um, it's something that comes up quite frequently in these sort of conversations is you in certain situations, you are going to have to keep your data with someone. So um, the next question we've got here is, is this applicable to other continents and countries, e.g. Africa? So it's a European regulation and applies to all member states in uh, Europe, well, in, within the European Union. Um, as you're aware, there are things called adequacy decisions. Broadly speaking, if an, org if an organization in a country in Africa or well, the United States or Australia or in Asia, for example, was to attempt to reach the point of the regulations that we have here, they will be doing a great service to their customers and to their clients and to their staff as well in making sure that privacy is fully respected and fully controlled. I'm I'm of the opinion that GDPR is one of the uh, most important uh, most important changes in terms of privacy around personal data in well, 20 years at least, um, and it's very very important that organisations across the world um, are looking at doing things in the same way. So while it's not legally binding on organisations based in other continents, it is a good idea to take the the lessons and the the regulations as uh, as advisory to how you can make your your organization work better and serve your service your customers better yeah it's just go one stage further than that as well i mean if if that country or continent is actually processing details about eu citizens it still applies because this is actually based around the eu citizen um, so if they were to suffer a data breach then um they could still be liable to a fine. Uh, and also when we talk about um, data processors and data controllers, you know, there's obviously, there's I think there's gonna be a question down there about software as a service. Um, typically, you know, it, take my organization, we, we are a data controller, we take in information about certain clients, um, but we also act as a data processor in some regards because we're, uh, we're processing data logs for our customers to come up with uh, information and, and, and help them with their problems. So we're processing their data. So they're, they're in that scenario, they're the data controller and we're the data processor. Now, some of that is done outside the EU, um, but we've obviously got a registered office within the EU. So we would still be liable for a fine, even if that, that uh, data breach was outside the EU. So it's important to note that even countries that are outside the EU, you can still get fined um, if you're processing information about EU citizens. Okay, so got a few more questions here. So um, this one is back onto data classification. You spoke about the steps to compliance. Uh, what would come under the stage of qualify? Yeah, so um, obviously once you've once you've uh, discovered where your data is, where it lives, who's got access to it, um, you need to then. And there are some automated tools out there that can help. And I said, you know, I've got lots of experience of many of the uh, software packages around. Um, they typically look at keyword searches. I mean, if you take PCI, for example, if you're talking about credit card information, that's a relatively straightforward um, pattern to look for. You know, typically card details all have the same format and structure, uh, a long number, an expiry date, or whatever it is. Um, so you'd be able to qualify that that data or that record relates to credit card information. It typically comes harder when you're looking at um, recipes or, you know, um, mergers and acquisition data. You know, you need to qualify. And that, when I talk about qualifying, it's kind of actually applying the classification scheme to the document or the, the data record. OK, so we'll uh, just do two more questions. Um, so I work for a software as a service company where our customers add cases onto our software, which we host and store the data on our database. Am I correct in saying that we would be the data processor and the customer would be the data controller? Um, yes, exactly that, yeah. <laughs> Presumably the, uh, the customers are companies and not individuals, uh, but yeah, they would be 
the controller because they're telling you how to store the data, what uh, setting the instructions, and how you're supposed to look after it. Granted, you offer the service, but they dictate uh, for the purpose of GDPR what you are allowed to do with that data. And one last one. Um, where an external service is used, for instance, a mailing list service, and a person unsubscribes and later asks for their details to be deleted. If the service does not allow deletion of those unsubscribes, is this an issue? Uh, yes, uh, is a simple answer. Um, essentially, because they're processing data for you, on your behalf, they have to uh, follow your instructions. So, um, in terms of an organization to organization situation. So um, if I if we received a, a right to forget request today uh, for someone who is on one of our external mailing lists, we would go to them and say, can you please remove this person's information from there? If they can't do that, that means that we that you're not being compliant and you could face a potential, well, Potential ICO investigation if the individual in question was to raise it. Um, and it also is not great customer service in terms of not being able to fulfill their legal legal rights, really. Have you got any other thoughts on that, David, at all? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> Okay. You are, you are, I mean, I mean we, we've all been we've all been bombarded recently with a with request to reconfirm our details, which is all you know. You can see how this is all related, and I, I suspect you will get to see more and more unsubscribe um, links come into into documents and whatever over the next uh, next four weeks. Yeah, and Manchester United obviously put in there. Please opt in to our membership list um, on their hoardings on the uh, around the stadium. There's definitely put the 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 thought into people's heads hopefully um thank you uh for all the questions today um if you've got if you've got any more questions please contact us at member experience at bcs.uk um after yeah. today i'm just i'm just gonna answer i'm just gonna ask answer one more question i've noticed okay. another one out there um about data classification being a big overhead how do you ensure this is not the case and people do it um as I said, there are quite a lot of software tools out there that, that do make it relatively straightforward to do classification when you're creating new documents, you know, i.e. you can't save it until you give it a scheme. You know, that's relatively easy to roll out and it's very easy to, to, to teach people how to do it, you know. Um, so it shouldn't be a big overhead and it's, you know, on the actual machine itself, it's not a big overhead. Um, you know, typically they're getting easier to use, easier to manage and easier to deploy. Um, so it needn't be as big as it was. And if uh, if you want to contact me, I can, I'm quite happy to talk about some of the solutions and um, which ones I think are better and why. Oh, back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to put up a poll today uh, that says, what would you like to see from us in future for webinars? We have got a wide range of speakers, um, all as great as uh, David and um, all as knowledgeable as uh, as he is. I hope you found today's session really useful. Um, we'll keep the poll running for a little bit longer. I'm going to post the email link for further questions into the chat now. Um, and also the recording should be available and shared with everyone after today, or well, within three days. Uh, and hopefully it'll be available on our website as well. Um, thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's session. Um, and yeah. Thank you. And thank you to David as well. Thanks a lot, Martin. Thanks, everybody.